Thank you very much. I, 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 I can't tell you how much I appreciate being here. Um, I think what you're doing uh, in, in trying to stimulate and, and teach entrepreneurship um, is as important as any endeavor going on in the world of journalism today. And I, and I, and I say that uh, uh, without an ounce of I hyperbole. Um, for all kinds of reasons, one being that we are in this uh, extraordinary period of reinvention, um, and that reinvention is going to happen to large degree coming out of the heads of the people that you teach, um, and, 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 and nothing in truth is, is more important than that. I also, by the way, think of entrepreneurship in the broadest possible sense. Um, I don't think of it as, as, as simply the notion of starting businesses. Um, that's certainly a big part of it. That's probably its most familiar definition. Uh, but it's only one. Um, in, in truth, it's about, it's about driving people to innovate um, uh, in, in, in whatever form uh, th they're in, whether it's a company, whether it's inside an organization, whether it's about themselves. Um, and in fact, I mentioned this last night to, uh, to Dan, that I think that in, in teaching entrepreneurship, and I think, frankly, everyone uh, should, should go through this, uh, you really want to start with the individual. Uh, because particularly in today's world, right, uh, uh, where, where, where you're not seeing people who spend 25 years in one place. Um, you know, I've got a 30 plus year career um, and I've lost count, but I think the number of gigs is somewhere between 12 and 15. Uh, that's far more typical than atypical uh, going forward. And so we all, in a sense, have to be entrepreneurs about our careers and how we, how we develop our own businesses being ourselves. Uh, so again, I, I think it's I hugely important, um, and, I'm, and I'm honored to have the opportunity here to, to, to ramble and rant at you for the next 45 minutes, and, and I thank you for your patience in, in listening to me do that. Uh, I'll start off with a couple of caveats. One is that, that, that I am not a journalist, um, and, and don't get me wrong, it's not that I wouldn't be honored to take that label. Um, uh, I just don't feel I've earned my stripes. Um, I have, over the course of that career, created a half a dozen news products. I've actually held editor-in-chief titles a few instances, but I've never reported a story, and I've never been down in the trenches uh, 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 doing what uh, journalists do, and so I've always been quite concerned about attaching that label to myself. Uh, nor am I a, a journalism educator, nor do I play one on TV, um, which won't stop me from registering opinions about same. Um, I am, uh, I consider myself a technologist, uh, and, and in a sense a product architect, um, and, and I've spent basically my entire career, as I said, over 30 years, uh, basically in that world. Uh, you know, starting off in 1979, believe it or not, with, you know, first on-demand information services and broadcast teletext, um, on to the broadband services of at home, uh, the Excite portal. Um, you know, I won't bother to go through the whole list, but, I've, but the interesting thing about it is, is what I was recalling recently, I, I will, you'll hear me every once in a while refer to the term the matrix, um, and, and I feel like over the course of that career I've had this extraordinary opportunity to work the matrix from its every dimension, uh, whether it was creating news products or working on trust layers uh, or understanding how pseudonymity has a role in online environments. Uh, there's, there's, there's barely a dimension that I haven't had the opportunity to play with along the way. Um, and, and that, to me, is, uh, is, has been just an extraordinary pleasure. I am, in many regards, the luckiest guy in the world. I will tell you that up front. I have been extraordinarily fortunate in the opportunities I've had, um, and extraordinarily fortunate to be actually playing the role I'm playing at, at, at Google today. Um, because, frankly, it's just a, it's a great opportunity to continue to learn and continue to try to do interesting things. So let's talk about that. Um, you know, one of the things when, when I make mention of the fact that, that uh, or folks have introduced me and they go through this long career and so on and so forth, I remember once, once someone said to me, well, that must mean, Richard, that you know all the answers. Well, no, I don't. Uh, in fact, the truth is, the way I look at it, I've simply had the opportunity over the course of my career to make far more mistakes than anyone else in the room. I guarantee it, and we can, uh, we, we can compare notes. Uh, but, I have, uh, but I've done that, made a lot of mistakes. And the question isn't about, and this is so true about entrepreneurship, it's not about whether or not you make mistakes, it's simply how quickly you take and learn from them, how quickly you change the course. 
uh, how quickly you draw lessons. Uh, because you will make mistakes. That's, that's exactly the objective. And interestingly, in today's tech world, it has become more pronounced in that regard. Right? Reed Hoffman said something recently where it's that, that if you're not embarrassed by your website when you first launch your business, then, then you've waited too long to launch it. Right? The point is you, we want to get out there and iterate and learn from the audience and learn from our users and move on from there. Uh, so I think that's important to tell these students uh, in that regard. I hadn't heard the term crash and learn. I've been around, been doing this for 30 years and I hadn't heard that term crash and learn. I love it. Um, I'm going to own it. I'm going to make it mine. Let's talk a little bit quickly about uh, innovation. A um, couple of things here. Uh, you know, I think because for the most part over the course of history, change has not been that rapid, is that we don't tend to think of, we tend to put innovation in its place. And I think that's a huge mistake and it's not what we can afford today. You know, innovation isn't a luxury. Innovation is not something that's done by uh, a special department. Uh, it's not something that's done on an intermittent basis and it's certainly not done by, uh, you know, the notion of a chief innovation officer. Uh, in fact, you know, every time I see a public company uh, announce a chief innovation officer, I want to short the fucking stock and uh, pardon my language there because it's just, it's just the wrong approach. It has to be built into the DNA of the organization. It needs to be built into every individual because also th there's the suggestion somehow when we talk about chief innovation officers or when we talk that it's about, that it's only about the product and how the product confronts the user. And that's not really the case. And if you look at the most successful companies, if you look at Google, if you look at Apple, you know, the, it, Apple, it's, it's interesting with Apple because everyone focuses on Jonathan Ivey and Steve Jobs and on, on the user experience and certainly very powerful, but Apple's innovation goes down to figuring out what new materials can we use in the creation of, the, of, 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 of that laptop. Uh, you know, how do we, how do we create new chipsets that can get more done in one environment? Innovation happens everywhere. What's the right out of box experience? How do you design the box? How do you make the box? All of these things are part of it. Similarly at Google, innovation in every dimension. You know, easy for me up front with, with developing user experiences, but the same degree of intense innovation happens with the people working on the server farms that make everything work as fast as we make it work. So it has to be everywhere. It has to be part of our DNA. Um, and, 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 I, and I just, we can't emphasize that enough. <coughs> Technological change. I think first of all, it's important to recognize that, that you know, technology is not the solution. Uh, technology in and itself has no values, right? It's a tool, can be used for good, can be used for bad. In our case, in the media environment, what it is also, it is the playing field. It sets the rules of the game and we have to react to it. We can, as best we can, look to harness it to our interests and it can move us forward. Uh, but I often find that folks are looking at technology for the wrong reasons, either to blame it or see it as a savior, and it's neither. Can be, has the potential, uh, but in and of itself, it is not. I mean, I go back, one of my favorite examples on this was, is, the whole, uh, is the whole evolution uh, of tablets, starting out with the Kindle reader. I mean, I, this, when I first did this slide, the Kindle had just come out. Um, and the iPad, what, a year, a year or so later. And, and my phrase about the iPad was that it was a fatal distraction for publishers, and, and I think I've proven to be quite correct in that regard. Because everyone was looking at the iPad and saying, oh, this can bring back our old model. Now people will pay for our precious content. Now I can have those full-page glorious ads that, that the user stumbles between going from article to article. What? Really? What made people think this way? What made people think that the idea of a tablet, a beautiful device, and, and clearly extremely innovative in terms of what you can do with the user, user experience, but how does that change the underlying economics of content, right? And that's what's actually changed the world here. And that's not gonna get altered by a device. Won't happen can't happen, hasn't happened. And we saw that, there was a flood of folks doing content apps, I hate content apps. Completely out of the flow of any common user behavior and in interacting with information in our online world. Yet we expect people to go to the siloed content apps to, to, to take advantage of my content. 
doesn't work that way. And we've not seen any success stories to back that up. So again, it's important to understand technology for what it can do. It's just as important to understand what it can't do. And it's just as important to understand that you can't make, you can't think it into saving your bacon in, in times of trouble. Uh, it's not a magical solution to anything. And again, I'm a technologist. I love the stuff, but I also understand its limits. Uh, you know, a while back, I, I, I was asked to give a talk, I think it was at UC Berkeley, and I said, could you please give us a, uh, a survey of where we are with technology? And I say, I ain't going to do that, uh, because frankly, it's pointless. Uh, because here, too, it's not about the technology of the moment, because the technology of the moment is going to be here for a moment. You know, the truth is, it's, and again, not that one shouldn't understand that and absorb it and embrace it. But too often I find that our mindsets get hooked on an individual piece of technology. Um, I was at another conference recently and someone, and I'll come back to the story probably a couple of times, and they said, you know, we really shouldn't, uh, journalism schools, we're spending too much time te teaching technology. Look what happened with Flash. We spent all that time teaching people Flash, and now Flash is gonna be dead. I went, what? That's crazy. Yeah, Flash might die. Assume it does. Does that mean we don't teach people how to use tools? We don't teach people how technology impacts what we do in our world of journalism? I can assure you that anyone who learned Flash learned profoundly about how to architect stories and architect user experiences, and whatever they learn there will translate to whatever the next new bit of technology comes along. And that's the kind of thought process we have to take to technology. Uh, but the pace, of, you know, all of these, whether it's the networks, whether it's computers, whether it's mobile, all of these things are going to continue to change, um, uh, you know, which is crucial to keep in mind. And not only will they change, the interaction, interactions between them cause change. The flows of data between them cause change. Uh, so it's, it's just that. It's not just the capability of the tools, but it's the effects they have, and it's how we as users, uh, 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 in a sense, put value and take value from the network of technology. Um, you know, so again, the pace of change will not abate. You know, I, I, I was uh, having a conversation recently uh, with, a, the, with an assistant dean of a J school, and I said, you know, um, sometimes I fear that there is this perception that we are in a period of transformation, as in moving from one steady state back in the heyday of, 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 of uh, newspaper monopolies over to another steady state where all will be glorious again. And that ain't going to happen. Because if anything, the pace of change is quickening, all right? And it's constant, which is why all of what we're talking about here is so important. Because it's not just about rethinking how journalism is done, how journalism is presented to the user, all of the aspects and attributes of how we perform journalism. It's not just figuring out how that works for today. It's the ongoing process of continuing to rethink that as things move forward. Absolutely crucial. So technology, again, when I think of, 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 of technology in terms of J schools, um, you know, it, it can provide great value, but only if we make it so. Uh, and I think it's crucially important for every journalist to have a good understanding of that, have a good understanding of the tools. I'm not saying everyone has to be able to, to write code, uh, at, that everyone has to be a computational journalist, but everyone needs to have, have an understanding of how these pieces fit together and have an understanding of as many possible tools as they can because indeed it's the technology that defines the palette of the medium, right? It gives us, it, it defines what we can do. It is the tools of our trade. Um, and so if anything, we need to figure out how to get that to be a more pervasive component of how we school uh, the next generations of journalists. It's definitely not just for the geeks. So let's talk about technology's impact. And I don't want to spend a ton of time on this because we all know this too well, right? Spending time talking about the collapse of the traditional news industry is not terribly productive. At this point, I think it's just as well if we leave it to the historians to worry about. But on the other hand, it does have lessons uh, that we can learn from. So I just want to make a couple of quick points here uh, rather than talking about the causes. I think we know them and they're quite well. To me, it's very simple. Right, the death of the print model, and it is the death of the print model, was the open distribution of the internet, said and done. Right? Can't blame Craigslist, you can't blame Google, that's irrelevant. 
right? We opened up the internet, we put capability in people's hands. Craig Newmark took that capability and created an extraordinary product in Craigslist. How can anyone complain with the usefulness and value of Craigslist in our environment, in our society? Well, you can complain if your business is based on classifieds, but the truth is, is what he did was a very good thing. So it was the openness of the environment that frankly changed the playing field because that openness broke the distribution control uh, that, uh, that the previous uh, media uh, behemoths had. And, the, and with it, their opportunity to control pricing. Uh, I mean, it's interesting. We, I, 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 a few things get my hackles up more than the over-romanticization of the past, right? It's very easy. We paint these pictures of these shining news organizations, palaces on the hill who did all good and no wrong. And I'm not going to get into what they did right or wrong, but we also need to get straight on our history, right? There was nothing sacred about the model that made those companies intensely successful for that limited period of time. But it's important to note that it was a limited period of time. Right? News was a fiercely competitive industry until about 1960. If you go across the history, right? Some people made good money in it, but you had five, six, seven newspaper towns, and the biggest circulation paper did pretty well. The number two did okay, the rest struggled, right? But then something happened that changed the landscape, and that was television, right? And that actually shifted the newspaper industry into its mode of great profitability, because what happened with television is you saw a dramatic reduction over the course of about 10 years from five newspaper towns down to three, down to two, down to one newspaper towns, maybe two with a joint operating agreement, and in both cases, a period of near monopolistic control over pricing, and thus huge profitability. Fabulous. Great that it occurred. But in truth, like many things, an accident of time and place. And it's important to keep that in mind. Disruption, live by it, die by it. Right? Newspapers during that period of time were successful because of an earlier disruptive technology, which was television, and now are being disrupted by a later technology being the internet itself. So it's important that we keep these things in mind when we have these discussions, uh, because they're ongoing, right? These things are going to continue to happen. It's not the first, not the last. So we're going to talk some about economics. And the reason I want to talk about economics is because I feel here, too, when it comes to journalism education, it's something that we need to bring into the equation to a far greater degree than we have in the past. You know, one of the things that, that, that I have uh, had you know, great qualms about is the, is the, you know, the prior behavior where, where, where journalists almost determinedly ignored understanding anything about the business side of the operation. Like it was evil, it was wrong, it was sinful to know that. And that's crazy, right? I mean, we understand the need for the separation between the business side and the editorial side when it comes to decision making. That, however, should not be an excuse for lack of knowledge, lack of wisdom about how these things work. And particularly as we go forward into this highly competitive environment, this highly rambunctious, ever-changing environment, it's important for journalists to understand that dimension of their world as well. How does this work? Uh, how do the business models evolve? What is working today versus not working today? Where it might it go going forward? And so let's just talk a little bit about that. I don't want to spend a ton of time here. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, I don't think any journalist can ignore the business side going forward. They do so, you know, at their peril. Um, so understanding the economics. One of the reasons uh, that, I, that, that caused me to go back and run Salon for a couple of years was, frankly, I wanted to get my hands very dirty in, in the trenches of, of, of news economics and try to understand as best I could what was, what was good, what was bad, what could be manip manipulated, what could not. Uh, and it was a very useful experience. Uh, but let me talk a little bit about that and just kind of lay a, 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 a couple of basic sort of ground uh, facts uh, that we might consider. Uh, again, you know, as I note here, presume no economic savior. Um, in fact, you know, for the most part, I think it's, it's, it's not terribly productive to spend a lot of time talking about the past. This is really about how we move forward. But lots of people like to think, is there a savior somewhere? 
you know, micropayments gonna, gonna take and, and, and change the environment? Probably not. Uh, what's gonna happen in the world of advertising where if anything, ad CPMs are gonna continue to drop because of the openness of the advertising marketplace of the web. Subscription fees, they can work, but they can work in only situations where there's extraordinary value. Uh, and we can talk further about that. You know, with all of the discussion about, about pay models, the truth is, is the only one who's pulled it off quite well as a major publication anyways, a lot of minor ones, uh, is the Wall Street Journal, high value business content. Not necessarily a good, uh, a, a good case study to use when you're talking about a general interest newspaper in a, in a metropolitan market. Um, not that subscription fees cannot be part of it, but be careful about thinking that, uh, uh, um, uh, that there's a, you know, something that's gonna come over the horizon and, 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 and change the physics of the market. Uh, we can't change the physics of the market. We can only adjust our own behaviors uh, to how those uh, uh, marketplace factors are evolving. But a couple of rules of thumb here, you know, and this, and this, and this chart here speaks loads about the, 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 the challenge that major newspapers have. Uh, I looked at two key numbers on an ongoing fashion at Salon, and, and one was a fairly obvious one, the RPM. You know, what was your revenue per thousand page use? And I'm using just some, the, the, uh, these numbers aren't precise, but they're, 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 they're in the ballpark. Um, you know, so but Salon, the, uh, the revenue per thousand page use was about 10 bucks, right? Interestingly, at that time, 2009, 2008, uh, the New York Times RPM was about $10 as well. Uh, because when I was last at Google, one of, the, one of my assignments there was to spend a lot of time working with the New York Times. So I had a pretty good insight into what their numbers looked like. It's beyond that now. They've had a couple of quite good years. And their, CP, uh, their RPM is probably up in the 15 to $20 range, but it's still, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not a massive number. Now, you know, standard business math says that your, the cost of your product needs to be no more than half of, 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 your, of, of the price of that product, of your gross revenue from that product. Uh, so in our case here, I said, well, fine, if our RPM is $10, then our cost per thousand page views needs to be five, right? And so we focused a lot on that. What's our cost per thousand page use? We did it writer by writer. Not so much that we wanted to make decisions about who to hire and who to fire. We didn't use it for that at all, quite frankly. But we did use it because clearly there were certain kinds of content that we did, certain kinds of journalism that we did that we knew weren't gonna pay for themselves in and of themselves, all right? But it was a useful number to, to, to folks to understand. And it was something that I wanted the editorial people to understand as well. Um, so we weren't at that, when I, when I left, we were down, we had it down to, when I got there, it was about 10 bucks. When I left, it was about 575 on the cost per thousand. So we were getting close, but we still weren't making money. Uh, you know, those are just raw numbers. We had other costs, sales costs, and so on and so forth factor into that. But the ugly thing here is if I looked at, and I don't know exactly what it is today, but when I did this several years ago and looked at it, the New York Times cost per thousand page views was somewhere in the area of $65 or higher. In fact, when I shared this number with the Times back then, nobody said it was wrong on the downside, all right? It's a lot of back envelope math. And that was basically taking out all of the print costs and just looking at the digital costs. So now you see the difficulty that, that those vehicles are in when they've got a cost per thousand pages of $65 and maybe an RPM of $15, $20, eh, the numbers don't meet, right? It's a, it's a very, very challenging uh, playing field. Um, so important to keep these in mind. The numbers change, the variable change depending on the type of, type of product, the market, the, focus of the, the market focus of the product and so on and so forth. These are just general numbers but help give you a sense of, of how these things work. Also with regard to the new economics, it's important to recognize that it's really less about demographics and more about context and relevance, right? And we see that a lot today in the advertising markets. And this is also a challenge and also an opportunity depending on what your focus is, right? Because the whole marketplace for advertising is com completely disaggregated and open. You know, what this means, for instance, is things like the following. Um, you know, back in the, in the heyday, as it were, uh, if, you, if you wanted to get to a high demographic in New York, you had no option really but the New York Times, right? And if you look at Tiffany's, Tiffany's is advertised in the front section of the New York Times like forever, right? In the front section, against international news, Darfur, expensive watches, 
They didn't mind in that environment. There is no way Tiffany's would spend a nickel using that same model online or anyone like it. They don't. They don't need to. They put their ads in places where the audience is more, not only more specific from a demographic perspective, but where their context, where their relevance, where their thought process is closer to the process of wanting to buy an expensive watch or bauble or whatever it is, right? And that becomes the challenge. Now, it's always been true, this is another fact about the newspaper business, that cross-subsidization was crucial, right? Investigative journalism never paid for itself. Uh, covering local politics never really paid for itself. The gardening section paid for it. The automotive section paid for it. The lifestyle section paid for it. That is still to a degree true today, but it's more difficult. And it's more difficult because today we have all of these niche <coughs> products focusing on key areas, right? You know, and this is one of the things that I did at Salon. We broadened our scope and said, fine, let's start a food section. Let's start, let's start sections that we felt were more relevant to advertisers. And it was helpful, but frankly, it wasn't easy because even in those segments, we were competing. We weren't competing against other major news organizations. We were competing against niche sites that were focusing just on cooking or just on parenting, or just on technology, and doing it with a keen product focus that was far more attractive to the advertisers than what we were doing at Salon. Uh, so again, cross-subsidization is still important, uh, but it is, if anything, more difficult than it was before. Uh, the fact is there is no significant premium for quality content, not that there ever was. I'm not saying there's no significant premium, and I think as we talk further, something that we want to look at is how do we create a sense of differentiation and value in this kind of environment? So let's talk about that. You know, I've, we've probably all heard that quote at the top, we need to get consumers back in the habit of paying for news. <laughs> right? I love that. Really? I mean, first of all, I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, understand something, a couple of key factors. First of all, they paid very little. You know, there's a, somehow this notion that if everyone simply paid for the news product, then the business would all of a sudden be good again. But if we truly understand the economics of the business, then the, the, the subscription fees paid for a tiny amount. In fact, they barely paid for the print that the newspaper was, was, was inked on. Uh, and second, they had a little choice because they were in markets where if you wanted local news in Des Moines, Iowa, you bought the Des Moines Register. You know, nothing, nothing, no other options there. Very different world here. So in truth, the real economic issue that we need to confront and recognize is that there's simply too much news, right? We've got, the, the, the volume is too great. So what do you do in that kind of environment? You can't turn around and say, oh, okay, let's all, do, let's all write less stuff, right? Let's bring the volume down so that we can actually increase the value. Well, that's not gonna work either. Not, not in the environment of the internet. However, it does to me begin to raise some questions as to where you focus your effort. You know, one thing that I do think about when it comes to, particularly if you look and carry this forward five or 10 years, you know, is you look and you say, well, does that cover everything model of the, the newspaper portal make sense, given the issues that I've raised? And in fact, you know, more so, when I look at some sites, and I, I, I have to admit, I was guilty of this at Salon. It's like you're chasing, you're constantly chasing audience, right? You want more uniques, more uniques. You want search engine optimization. We go for it, right? And so you look for stuff that will drive that audience. You try to stick clear to your mission, and we stuck clear our mission, but you try to do as much of that. So you're doing pop culture. Um, you, you know, you're doing Lindsay Lohan. Uh, you're doing all kinds of stuff that's interesting, that gets some clicks, but not necessarily high value clicks. But there's another concern there that I tend to, to, to the question I want to raise is, does that, in a sense, near valueless documentation of trivia in a forthright major news organization, uh, diminish the perceived higher value of the knowledge in, and insight, uh, 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 you know, thoughtful reporting that they're trying to do. You know? And when we're thinking about how do we take and differentiate a brand and create a stronger sense of value, might we not need to address that? Right. Again, I don't have an answer here. I'm, pausing, I'm, I'm posing questions. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's one for us to consider. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a, in, in a few minutes. 
Let's talk about the audience. Because here, too, I think it's important for everyone to understand audience data. You know, I don't shy away from that uh, at all. I never shied away from SEO at all, right? Because it's not a question of, of you know, people say, I, I can remember someone being at a conference and somebody from a major newspaper on the East Coast got up, not the New York Times, and said, you know, we do SEO, and, and I think, you know, it's causing us to make bad decisions. And I say, well, wait a second. You know, can you be very specific here? All right, tell me, do you have knowledge of specific decisions that were made in your organization based on misuse of data? And if you do, raise them. Fair point. Fair point. But do not use your fears about how it might be used to, to sort of castigate the notion that we should not be conscious about what our audiences are clicking on, that we shouldn't be conscious about how do we take and present our content in such a way that you will indeed optimize how many people find that content via search. Isn't that part of our mission? Isn't it our mission to inform? If our mission is to inform, don't we want to carefully think how we can do our best job of getting that nugget of knowledge into their heads? And if that means being clever about your terminology and using healthcare reform with healthcare being one word versus two words because that's, what, that's what's trending on the, on the search engines, of course you do. It's your responsibility to do so. So when it comes to this, you know, again, I think here too it's important to get people schooled on understanding the proper use of data. Uh, because if anything, all of this is getting more complex, right? Because we do have an overloaded content ecosystem. And the battle for eyeballs is waged on the user's terms, and you'll see that very quickly here in this next slide. And this is just a snapshot of, 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 of I've pulled data from a number of different sources of, quotes, a typical news site. And just to see what's happened over the last three years alone, right? Pardon if that's a confusing diagram, but I'll, I just want you to focus on one thing. Focus for the moment on the column on the left, direct, all right? with the red being the most recent, the green being oldest. Direct traffic to the home page. Look at its progression. 45% of the traffic went to the home page in 09, down to 30%, down to 25%. And by the way, this was in a period of growth, so this isn't necessarily a bad thing. What I'm showing is shares of audience here, not volume of clicks, right? The truth is the overall volume of clicks went up on all counts, but it's where it was coming from. Right? Look what happened in search. In 09, they were doing okay with search. They made it even better, brought it up to 32%, brought it up to 33%. All right? Huge percentage of traffic. Referrals stayed about the same, people linking to you. Social, hardly there in 09. 15% last year. And we haven't even come close to seeing the full maturation of the social environment as a, as, as a, as a source of people's interactions with content. Right. In fact, the reason why I went back to Google and I'm incredibly excited being there was really this, right? I think as some of you know, Google News is in the social division. I spend as much of my time working on Google Plus, if not more, than I spend on working on Google News uh, because it's just, just an extraordinary place to be given the evolution of the social layer of the web and what that means to news flows, what that means to how people access information, what that means to how they engage with each other and engage with the sources of that information. But this is a huge shift, a huge shift. And it's not done. It raises big questions. It raises questions, the whole social layer raises questions about what's ultimately the role of the destination news site. You know, I can imagine news organizations, small news organizations that live on social environments alone. Hasn't happened yet. It will happen, right? Because that's where the activity is happening. Now, who knows? You know, again, what I, the caveat I always put out here, technology is always changing. You know, if you go back and you, you, you think about it, you know, eight, ten years ago, all we were talking about was search engines, the rise of the search engines, and then a few years later was the rise of the blogosphere. We didn't even talk about social until four or five years ago, four years ago, right? Wasn't even in our lexicon. And now it's huge. It's what we almost said in many places, it's the only thing that's talked about. What's it going to be in three years? Could be something different again. So important to keep these things in mind. But again, this has huge impact. Another key thing that I pull out of that, when I look at these numbers here in red, what is that telling me? 
What does that tell me about what's the most important page on your new site? Is it the home page? No, it's not the home page because the home page, indeed, only 25% of your visitors came through the home page. 75% of your visitors came through the story page. Now, now, why is it in that regard, given that fact that every time I've, I have witnessed a design review for a new website, you know, the first thing they start off with is the home page. They put like 80% of their focus on designing the home page, and everything else is like, ah. And I say, no, 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 no. Put the focus on the story page. You know, and what can you do? to provide the best possible entry point to what you do there, and we'll talk about that. So let's talk about structure and form. You know, again, I, I, I don't know if you're sensing a theme here, but what, you know, what I've always felt about this as we go through this transformation is that, is that what we all really need to do is look at every dimension of the matrix. We need to rethink everything. It doesn't mean that everything changes. But it does mean that you go through the intellectual reconsideration of all your past assumptions. This is one of the things that Google is always, that it's built into the culture. Be careful what you presume, right? Because you'll be wrong. Things are changing. Question everything. It's easy. If you question it and you come back and say, no, actually, that was the right way to do it. Fair game. But question it. And so everything needs to be questioned, right? From, 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 well, we're going through it now. And the one thing we need to question is the structure and form of the content. And frankly, the thing that I find uh, incredibly frustrating is this is the area that has gotten the least focus over the last five to 10 years. And frankly, it's the thing that's closest to the innate capability of the journalist working in the space today. It's what they know. It's the structure and form of the content they present. Right? But we're still, in many cases, writing things the same way as that we did in the past. So let's talk about that in a couple of ways. First of all, rethinking the content architecture. As I said to Dan last night, I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm re-racking my slides because that's what I do the night before any time I give a talk. I said, but there's one slide in there, maybe two, that's like really old. This is a five-year-old slide. It's frustrating to me that this is a five-year-old slide because it says that some of the message isn't getting across. All right? Um, and basically, it's, 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 the, the thrust of it is this. It's recognizing that the atomic unit of content is the story, right? Not the site, it's the story. And if you think about music, you can think of the comparison. Because in the music space, for years and years and years, the atomic unit of content was the album, the CD. Now it, too, is the song, right? It's how, things pe how, it's, how people, it's how things flow, how people engage. They share music. They share songs. People buy songs. In the, in the news environment, it's again, it's not about the destination site, it's about the story. And it's important that we recognize that. And in fact, when I was at Google four years ago, one of the things that I initiated there was this effort on living stories, the living story page. An exploration of how do you take and, 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 and build a story, in a sense, into its isolated destination. Um, so, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, except to note the key thing here was, and the key learning was, if you look at the structure of Wikipedia versus the structure of a news story, and see the difference. And see the difference, in fact, in how it performs. Because Wikipedia, you know, one of these news organizations, not the Post, came to me and said, can you help us with our ranking when I was at Google? Because our topic pages are being outranked by Wikipedia. And I said, what, you want me to put my fingers on the scale? And they said, well, yeah. And I said, well, no. Uh, I said, the truth is, is your topic pages suck. Because one, it's not, it does not provide the, 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 the latest up-to-date information on the subject at hand. And you also have them out of the flow of the natural uh, uh, navigation of the audience, right? The topic pages are off on the side. Uh, one of the things that we did at Salon, and I'm not saying we did it superbly well, we had a, but we had a very small staff. But basically, the story page was the topic page. And every story landed on a page that was also the topic page relevant to that story. And the point was that you navigate them through it, and you expose them to it there. You expose them to the full depth of your knowledge about the story, and then also expose them to other opportunities that you might present on your site. But this is a, a very significant rethinking that still has not been done. Uh, both in form and function, that when it's not about edition-oriented ephemeral streams of articles, which end up going into the archive and die, it's how do you build 
a pyramidal base of knowledge about that story and, and, and see that singular page as the fullest expression of the knowledge of that reporter and that editor about that story, right? That's not happening today. Still not happening today. And in fact, one of the things here was uh, that, that, I, that I will mention. Um, when I was working with one of those news organizations, so I said, fine, I said, we'll do a test. And we did, we went in and we changed uh, several, 15 of their topic pages, updated them more frequently and so on and so forth. Two months later, they were rising in the rankings, many of them beating the Wikipedia offering, right? Great success. They were very happy. And they said, now we have to figure out how to do that across our topic pages. What was their answer? When I went back a month later, they said, well, it's gonna cost us about $10 million a year because we have to hire another 100 rewrite people. And I went, wait a second, wait a second. How does this make sense, right? You've got at least a reporter and at least an editor who is associated with every story you put out. They know more about that story than anyone else. Why don't they individually own that page? That's the pinnacle of their knowledge and everything else derives from that. What you put in print derives from that, not the other way around. So that's the kind of, to me, rethinking, that's not even a rethinking of the form, that's a rethinking of process and workflow and ownership, right? But that has not taken place yet. What's the role of the long form article? And again, I, you know, great experience. When you find a wonderful long form article, you get a great experience to lie back on the couch and spend an hour or two with it. But in the general scheme of things, doesn't work very well. One obvious reason, I had a great conversation, I had an opportunity to interview um, um, uh, Lewis Lapham a while back. And one of the reasons I love Lewis is he's one of the few people who thinks creatively about form. Right? He invented Harper's Index, right? And they said, well, it's simple, he says to me. He says, you know, the likelihood of getting a great piece of journalism goes down the longer the article. <laughs> You know, and what we found, and I did a lot of research on this, the average abandonment rate, again, at Salon on articles over 2,000 words was 75%. Literally 28% of the people finished the article. Now, I had some people say, well, that's actually pretty good. Well, maybe it's pretty good for long form articles, but what does it really say about our ability to inform? So I'm not here to berate the long form article, but I do say that, you know, where is its place? And are there better approaches to it in the world of journalism that we're entering? For that matter, what's the role of the social network post? You know, at News for a month ago, I had a session. I said, let's talk about the future of the social network post. And one of the things that came out of it that I learned, which I thought was very clever, is something that ProPublica does, right? And they still do these big 10,000, 15,000, 25,000 word pieces. Um, but what they are doing in the social post was very clever, right? Typically, what you find is like, they'll do a post on the article and they'll send it out. Right, that little snippet, the little enticing snippet. What they did was 10, 12, 15 enticing snippets, each one exposing a different nugget of content from that article. So I thought that was pretty clever. Well, basically they were using the nuggets of content of the social post to get information into people's heads and give other triggers to get to the content. Recognizing, yes, yeah, some percentage would go to the article, many would not, but they were using every opportunity to get knowledge into people's heads. And that, to me, is part of the thinking that we have to engage in, in thinking about form. All right, not only in the articles we write, in the, quote, appended components in social environments and whatnot, all needs to be rethought. And I just, you know, and I just cannot encourage folks enough to push people on this. How do we architect stories? Um, how do we architect stories, for instance, to, you know, can we be clever enough with our technology to address the read state? This was something that Larry Page to me said to me three years ago, and if I went, what, what was that? And he said, yeah, read state, right? We can do that. We can know when a person comes to our page what they've read on that page if they've been there before. Can't we rearrange the page and present it accordingly? Meaning if I'm following this story every day, um, you know, I give you the latest stuff. Why not? How can we, you know, are there opportunities to do that? That's not something that's gonna to happen tomorrow, but it's something that can happen. Computational journalism, huge untapped opportunity here, here too, where technology meets journalism in very, very powerful ways. I'm not gonna spend much time on this, except to say that there's, you know, in fact, here too is one of the examples where, you know, the one I show down here, this is Adrian Halvardi's work, who before he went off and did, uh, and did every block. 
uh, in, this, uh, in this thing that the Post did four years ago about the DC schools. The sat and it was a very powerful thing and very useful thing and, and actually monetizable because anyone who went to this site and looked up data about the state of their schools was also exposing where they lived, how many kids they had, what age those kids were, right? That's useful stuff on the business side. The sad thing was this was a one-shot effort. Extraordinarily sad thing. Because shouldn't reporting generate wherever possible persistent informational sources? You know, why wasn't this an ongoing measurement of the schools? I'm not saying that's easy, though frankly with good technology it does get easier instead of one-off efforts. You know, that 15,000 word two-day expose that dies and everyone forgets about a month later. It does not need to be so. This can't be the case in every instance, but it can be the case in many. Considering the roles, again, the tools are different, the output is different, the roles have to change as well. And so here too, I think, is important that, that, that organizations embrace, right? What is the day-to-day -day role of a reporter in an environment where creation and publication is entirely in their hands? That, old, that example about, about workflow with the topic pages, right? Why is that an article handing it off to an editor, handing it off to a copy editor, and, and, and then publishing it when everything can be done by that individual and owned by that individual? These are the directions that we need to move. How can we guide people, to me, again, another huge opportunity to understand how to leverage the trusted crowd, right? I mean, one thing that we know in today's world is that there are more people writing and publishing than ever before in the history of mankind. It doesn't mean it's all good. Frankly, wheat to chaff ratios probably stay about the same. A whole lot more chaff, but there's also a whole lot more wheat. And opportunity within that to leverage people's desire to participate, and that's one thing that we see time and again, is people's desire to participate if you give them the opportunity to do so. And if you create mechanisms to guide them and leverage them in a fair way. This is a skill set that we're just now seeing develop, but I think it's going to be a huge benefit to any organization, any news organization, who understands the skills and processes to do that very well. So again, the importance for us to, to understand roles. And next, architecture. You know, when it comes to journalism schools, we've talked about, yeah, how do we teach them how to report? To what extent do we teach them about technology? To me, there's another way that we might want to think about it, which is how do we teach them, guide them to think creatively about the product itself? And this is hard, particularly hard generationally. This may be very easy going forward. I tend to think many of these issues maybe evaporate simply with the passage of time. Maybe yes, maybe no. But you know, at Salon, I tried really hard to get our editorial team involved in the, in, in the evolution of the product. And frankly, I feel I failed. And it wasn't because they weren't interested. It's because they didn't really have the, and they'd never done it before, even though Salon was you know, an online-only publication since its beginning. It was really quite traditional in its thinking. And the fact is, and when I think about this in traditional news organizations, what I immediately recognize is this, right? Is that when you think about newspapers, for instance, or magazines, the form and function of a newspaper has not changed in 100 years. We added color printing, right? But beyond that, it stayed the same. All right. They didn't have to think, they had no reason to really think about outside the box. They didn't really reason to how to redesign the box, right? And that, so it's understandable why those cultures aren't there, but that cannot be the case going forward, because again, things are changing. People need to understand the architectural approach to how products fit together, how you take and, and use those to, to address your audiences. And everyone needs to be involved in that, understand how the product and the business model works. We've touched on a few of these things before. It's an overall collaborative process. In closing, a couple of things. First, I, I want to talk a bit about the mission. One of the interesting things with uh, the world we're in is it is vastly different in all kinds of ways, right? The inner tubes have had their impact, and some of it's good and some of it's bad. You know, to me, one of the negative impacts of the inner tubes is simply this, that any opinion, any belief, any fear, right, can find support on the internet. Somebody will say you're right. Lots of somebodies will say you're right. Not only will they support it, they'll give it amplification, all right? That's not something we had before because access to media was so much more limited. 
But that's not only is that, you know, is that an unfortunate consequence, is what we find is media organizations and political organizations who frankly cynically take advantage of that. Because in a sense, it's a lot easier to provide affirmation than information, right? As Clay Johnson said, who wants to hear the truth when they can hear they are right, right? So what I ask is, what does that say about our mission as journalists? What does that say about our tactics? When, when there's an even greater need for media literacy and cognitive reasoning than there has been in the past. And I'm not saying we're dumber now, I'm saying we're in a more complex environment and people need guidance and we need to be ever more careful about how we build our own credibility and sense of trust with these individuals so that they will believe that the sky is blue because the sky is blue and not because they learned on the web that they thought it was green and someone said, yeah, it's green. Doesn't work that way. Similarly with the ethics. And again, I'm not saying that the core principles change, but here too, our roles have changed, how we interact with the audience has changed, how we do our work has changed, and this too requires a reconsideration not only of the mission, but the guiding ethics that we, that we leverage. We can maybe talk more about this later, but I, wanna, but I wanna wrap here. So, optimistically speaking, and I am extremely optimistic. I mean, as I think I said in the beginning, I mean, I, I, you know, I have believed for a long time that the future of journalism will be far better than its past. Believe that to the core of my being. And I, and I hope and trust that everyone here believes the same. Right? We're in, it, yes, difficult times, but periods of extraordinary opportunity and periods of extraordinary creativity can happen. That's in our hands. And if people don't believe that, then frankly, I, I would encourage you not to be doing what you're doing. Uh, because it really needs all of our, 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 our positive effort. The news is, in, as I said earlier, is in trouble because everyone now has a printing press. How can that be a bad thing when you take it down to its core from, a, from the perspective of public discourse, right? Powerful thing. Would we go back? Of course not. Journalism's future will be, will be molded by many new creative endeavors. It's not, and the, my point of guidance here is I tend to think we focus too much on the drama of the ugly transmogrification of traditional news entities. It's a waste of our time, in truth. They're gonna go through what they're gonna go through. Some may make it, some may not. But they're not going to be the ones who are moving the ball forward. Can't happen that way. And it's simple theories of disruption, right? Which basically say you can't eat your own young. You know, you could go back and say, well, why didn't newspapers in 1995 respond to Craigslist and give their classifieds away for free? Really? You know, I say that and I say, really? Put yourself in the CEO slot of a newspaper at that time and say, I'm gonna give up my cash cow. I'm now a public company. I'm gonna tell the street I'm giving up my cash cow. Won't happen. Won't happen, understandably so, right? They can't compete with themselves. So time and again, what we see in disruptive periods is that new players replace the old because they had that burning, passionate innovation without any bounds, without any constraints telling him, don't go there, protect that revenue model. Oh, don't forget his job is, that's the way his job works, don't change it, right? I mean, even in my experience at Salon, where everyone, I came in and said, look, we gotta rethink everything. And everyone said, yeah, we gotta rethink everyone, everything. And that was fine until we got down to individual roles. And people said, oh, me? change what I do? Rather not do that, thank you. So this is where we have to put our focus. Not on how we change old institutions, but how we build new ones, right? How do we nurture the kind of entrepreneurship to help this happen? Uh, this is where the power is. Again, journalism future will be stronger than its past, and the truth is, is it needs to be, right? I mean, given the environment that we're in, given the world that we're in, given what I said earlier about the, how the, you know, the internet can affirm any bizarre belief, we have to make it better. And it can be better, and there's great reason for us to believe that so. But I think in that regard, we're not only reinventing journalism, and I think the reason you're here is we need to reinvent journalism education at the same time. Right? And figure out how we each, and again, I'm not the curriculum designer, don't play one on TV, but it's very clear to me that we have to rethink everything about what we do in journalism education as well. And that's hard. And that's hard. And it can be bloody. But I think it's absolutely necessary if we're going to get the desired effect. Uh, and, I, and I really appreciate that the folks in this room are trying to do what you're trying to do because I think it's really at the leading edge of all of that. And with that, I apologize for the lengthy rant. <laughs>